welcome everybody to today's Jilla Colloquium. As you know, these colloquia are designed to allow all our Jilla people to communicate to everybody, especially with staff and students and those who are not experts. Welcome. Today, Andreas Becker is going to be giving the Jilla Colloquium. He came to Jilla in 2008, 14 years ago, after a six year stint as a group leader at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden. He has a group that does theory. He's been a fellow since 2008. And for the last two years, he was Jilla chair he stepped down from that in December, and uh, Conrad Leonard has taken over, for which I think Andreas is very thankful. So Andreas is going to talk about light and matter interactions on ultra-short timescales. Andreas, you have the floor. Thank you, Andrew, for the kind introduction. I hope you don't mind if I take off my mask for the, for the talk. Um, good, thank you very much for, for coming today and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. So uh, it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about light matter interaction at ultra short timescales. And uh, I hope I have a little bit for everyone, for those who are, are not experts in the field, maybe also a little bit for those who are experts in the field. So uh, if I talk about ultra short timescales, uh, there is a, there is a very famous example a uh, long time ago that I like to show at the beginning. And many of you probably have seen this uh, before, but of those of you who have not seen it, I thought I'd bring it up at the beginning. Now, uh, it's a kind of scientific question that uh, more than 100 years uh, ago or 150 years almost ago, uh, people had at that time, and I call it a scientific question, although it, there it was a bet actually between two, uh, two horse owners. And it's the question about if a horse is galloping, does it at some time instant has all fine four legs in the air? And uh, they could not agree on this. And it's actually hard to see uh, because oh, I cannot resolve this motion uh, fast enough. And uh, how can you resolve such a motion? Well, you have to take photos or you have to take a movie of this and you have to take uh, snapshots of this. So this was actually the start of ultra short photography. So I'm always asking myself if I should not put a clicker question here actually and, and ask you yes or no. Uh, so it was Edward Moorbridge uh, who developed at that time the shutter of a camera with which you could actually resolve this question. And if you look through this, you don't have to look very far. Here's the, here's the snapshots where you see that the horse actually has all four legs in, in the air. But it is something where, we, where it has started from that we want to resolve motions that are so fast that our eye cannot do this at that time. And uh, at that time, it was the development of a shutter of a camera. Nowadays, the fastest shutters of cameras, as I've looked it up, is, is about 10 to the minus five seconds. So it's pretty fast. You can make wonderful photos. Uh, I encourage you to look at the internet, plug in ultra fast photography. Uh, here are some of my examples that I found, uh, uh, that I found quite interesting. You see here a bullet going through. I even don't remember anymore what this is. You see water droplets coming here out, uh, a feast that is, is pounding into water. So uh, this is uh, now these very fast phenomena with photos we can actually resolve nowadays. Now that is not far, by far not fast enough of what we are doing nowadays. Uh, what we are doing nowadays here in Agila in experiment and other words in the, in the world is what we want to resolve are the rotation of molecules, the vibration of molecules. And now we are at the stage actually where we want to see electron motion in molecules or atoms, and we want to resolve this. Now, clearly we cannot see this with the eye, but what is more important here is actually, if you look at the time scales, so rotational motion is of the time scale of 10 to the minus nine to 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Uh, vibration is on the order of 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And if you think about electronic motion, it is even faster than uh, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Now to resolve these kind of motions, uh, you need other tools. You cannot use photography or you can use photography, but you need a different tool for this. 
And the tool that we are using for this are ultra short laser pulses. So the development of ultra short laser pulses is driving this whole thing, what we can actually resolve. As shorter the laser pulses, as better we can resolve these kind of motions. Yeah. Okay, so just for those, we are coming down here after, so this is a picosecond, 10 to the minus 12 seconds, 10 to the minus 15 seconds is one femtoseconds. And if we are below this, we are down to what is called a nanosecond. And this is when you nowadays uh, listen to talks about ultra short uh, laser science, you will talk, uh, you will hear very often the, the terminology of attosecond physics or attosecond science. So just for those of you who are not so familiar with these kind of, of, uh, of numbers, like 10 to the minus 18 seconds, uh, you can write it down in, in this way with 17 zeros after the decimal point. You can write it down in this form. Uh, it's a billionth of a billionth of a second. Or as Gila, I like to think also about this, Well, the shortest time scales that we are looking at is something like 10 to the minus 18 seconds. And the longest time scales at Gila that we are looking at is 10 to the 18 seconds. And uh, well, we are sitting just in the middle somewhere up here, right? Uh, so we are spanning really the whole thing here. And uh, especially we are going to the front uh, extremes or let's call it the frontiers here actually. Okay, so that's another way of, uh, of, of claiming what is an after second. Now, I said already, uh, this whole thing has to do, if you want to resolve this motion, it has to do with ultra short laser pulses. So what I'm showing you here on the left side is the pulse duration of laser pulses, how it has developed over the years, actually. And you see that since the invention of the lasers, at the beginning, there was a constant drop, actually, of the pulse duration. It went down from 10 to the four. It is plotted here in femtoseconds down to something like 10 femtoseconds and then just a little bit below uh, 10 femtoseconds. And as far as I remember, Margaret, you can, you can correct me on this. You were one of the first ones, or if not the first one who developed a, a, a laser pulse as short as below 10 femtoseconds. So this is something that uh, Gila has helped actually to make breakthroughs or researchers who are nowadays at Gila have had to make this breakthrough here up to 10 femtoseconds. Now, then you see there was a stop actually. There was a stop in, it didn't drop further down. It stayed here for almost 15 years until in 2000, there was a further drop here actually. Now, why did this happen here? Well, those of you uh, who know a little bit more about light, you know that light has a wavelength and it has an electric field and a magnetic field. So. Here is shown, let's say, the electric field with a pulse envelope here. And nowadays, laser, the most stable lasers are more or less at the wavelengths of 800 nanometers. If you look at the oscillation period of the electric field, one oscillation period is 2.6 femtoseconds. And you see here is clearly a limit, actually, how short I can make a pulse, because I need at least one cycle of an electric field in, in such a pulse. So that was. The restriction that one had here actually for these kind of lasers with 800 nanometers, I can bring it down. I can generate pulses that are as short as something like 2.6 femtoseconds, but one femtosecond is here as actually a barrier. We cannot go further. So then was the question, how can we go further here? The idea was out for, some, for quite some time already. And Margaret and Henry who are in, in the audience here are uh, pioneers in this and has driven this field a lot. It is high harmonic generation actually that you have to do. What you have to do is you have to go to shorter wavelengths. And if you have shorter wavelengths, then you can cal calculate, you come to shorter pulse durations. So we have to generate pulses at, via the process of high harmonic generation at shorter wavelengths. And then we can do the same process, bring it down to let's say one cycle in the, in the limit, and we can go to shorter uh, oscillation periods here. And with this in 2000, it was able to, to drop the pulse duration even further. And nowadays, I think the record R is about some few tens of attosecond pulses actually that I can generate. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about this process of high harmonic generation. Let me tell you first, what is the concept of this? And then what is actually, since I'm a theorist, what is the theoretical challenge actually to calculate this process? Now, in this uh, question, sorry to interrupt. Sure. Why does that graph stop in 2005? Oh, this is because I took a picture, uh, a figure from a, 
uh, from an article that was published in 2008, maybe. <laughs> so uh, we have not dropped much further, right? We are, we are at, so here, this is 100 frame per second. I think we are, we are maybe somewhere here at the moment. Yeah, so, so we are around 50, 40, uh, 20 attoseconds or so. These are the shortest passes. Yeah, there are concepts out actually that you can even go shorter than that, uh, but they have not been realized. Good, so what is this process of high harmonic generation? And uh, it is a process actually that you have to take into account two different parts of the process. One is a microscopic part, and the other one is a macroscopic part of the process. So what is the microscopic part? Well, you're using a laser pulse, a laser pulse, the electric fields are strong enough so that you can ionize an atom. So this is shown here in a, in this first step of the process, actually. So we are looking first just at the microscopic part here. So an electron is ripped off uh, the atom, it's emitted from the atom. So it's an electric field. Electric fields can accelerate electrons. The electron is accelerated away from the atom. Then since it's an oscillating electric field, electric field changes its shine, its direction, and the electron wave packet or the electron can be driven back to the atom and can recombine here with the atom. Now, if the electron recombines with the atom, uh, radiation is generated, and that's the XUV and X-ray radiation that we are looking for. Yeah, so this is the process in, often it's also called the three-step process of high harmonic generation. Something that I said, the group of Margaret and Henry are actually pioneers on this uh, with, uh, with some other groups in the world. Now that's one part of the process. Uh, that is what is happening within a certain atom, actually. You can also think about that you're driving the electron actually back and forth and you're like a dipole and you're generating uh, radiation now. Now you don't want to do this just for one atom. You're pre reproducing, you're generating just one photon. That's not very intense light. So what you then need to do is you have to think about the macroscopic process. Uh, and in the macroscopic process, you now think about that this process is not happening in your laser focus within one atom, but it was in by many atoms, thousands, hundreds, thousands, trillions of atoms actually that you have in your laser focus or in your gas beam. And now what you have to make sure is that the radiation that you have, that you're producing in each of these atoms or with the help of each of these atoms, they have to be emitted in phase. And that is the so-called phase matching. And that's a very difficult uh, problem that Margaret and Henry actually have uh, uh, um, looked at very carefully and have looked very carefully at this face matching and have uh, figured out a lot of techniques how to do this face matching actually. And with this, you can then generate these uh, uh, pulses at shorter wavelengths that are coming then out as attosecond pulses. Yeah. Now that's the idea behind the whole thing. And it has been, uh, as I said, uh, uh, gener uh, uh, generated uh, in many different experiments. Also, it's, a, it's a very much a focus here of uh, the experimental work at, at GILA. So uh, you can think about this process also, and this is a former postdoc of, or that was here at GILA, Carlos Hernandez Garcia, uh, in the following way of this microscopic process that all of these atoms have produced this radiation actually in phase. Uh, so he has made the analogy that uh, essentially you can think about each of these atoms as a music musician and each of them is playing a, a, a tune or a, a melody. And you want to have that all these musicians obviously are um, playing this, uh, this melody uh, in phase actually so that you hear a nice melody. What you need for this is a conductor and actually you have to make sure that the laser is the conductor that everyone is playing in phase with this. So uh, with this, let me go over and now talk a little bit about theory. So I'm a theoretician, you have to go through some, some formulas here. Uh, so what is the theoretical challenge here actually to, to model this kind of process? Now, as I told you, there are two different processes that we have to consider. We have to consider the microscopic process and we have to consider the macroscopic process. The microscopic process is a quantum process and 
If you deal with quantum mechanics, you deal with this kind of formula, which is nothing else than the Schrodinger equation. So you have to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Yeah. Now, this is something that no analytical solutions exist, especially not if you're in an intense laser field where the interaction of the field with the electrons and the interaction of the electrons inside the atom or the molecule are actually of similar strengths. No analytical solution exists. You can do approximative solution, or you can nowadays solve this on the computer. And I will talk a little bit about that. On the microscopic part, this is not longer a quantum process because we have many atoms that are producing here something. So we have many photons here, actually. We can treat this as a classical process, a classical radiation process. So essentially what you have to do, you have to solve the Maxwell equations. Also for this, for such a kind of process, no analytical solution exists, only approximative solutions. I will talk a little bit about this. You can try to do both of this together on the computer. That's a very tough challenge. Some people have done this. There exist solutions for this. People have simulated this. None, none of these simulations was, is anywhere close to what is done in the experiment, actually. So there exist things. Uh, numerical methods where you can couple these two things together, but you cannot via this simulate any kind of experiment that is actually done. So what you, can you do actually as a theoretician then? Well, for this kind of process, so I tell you now what we are doing, for this kind of process to solve the Maxwell equations, there exists a solution that is actually pretty powerful. And uh, many of you might have learned this either in your undergraduate studies or in your graduate studies, is essentially what we are using is a radiator solution. So it is a dipole solution just. You learned about what is the uh, radiation that is emitted from a dipole. So what is happening with the electron in the atom, it's driven by the laser field, it's acting like a dipole. And for this, we have actually a solution here. Now we would like to still couple this with the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Now, so let's think about this. Uh, this part has been uh, studied quite well. And although we have trillions of atoms in the experiment, essentially what you can go away from is that you need actually the response from let's say 100, 200, 500 thousands of atoms. So let's keep this in mind. We need the response from 500 thousands of atoms here. Now for each atom, the laser field looks different. So we have to solve for each of these atoms the time dependent Schrodinger equation, which takes us something like 10 to 1000 minutes. Usually for what we are doing at the moment, it's more closer to 10 to 30 minutes. Now, that means it is 30 minutes times 500,000 times. Now, you can make your calculation. Uh, I cannot convince any incoming graduate student to do such a work. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, it's, it's impossible. So we need something that helps us here, actually. Now, and Agnieszka had a great idea, actually, or a great observation there that you don't have to do this 500,000 times because essentially what you can do is you can interpolate these kind of results, which is a very surprising result because this is a highly nonlinear process. Still, if you go from one intensity to the other, you can interpolate the results and still get exact, almost exact results. So in the end, what we do is we have to solve this not 500,000 times, but we have to solve it just 100 times and then we are interpolating in between. Interpolation is something that goes very quick. We know all how a quick interpolation goes. So we solve this 100 times, then interpolate to get the result from 500,000 atoms here actually. Now that is something that works and we can use the time dependent Schrodinger equation here actually. <clears throat> now this is something that we have used frequently in this form before in more approximative forms. And uh, we were able to support here a lot of the experimental milestones that have been achieved in Henry and Margaret's group here at GILA. So for example, they have produced, K Margaret and Henry were the first who have produced KEB X-ray harmonics. You see here the spectrum. Here you see the theoretical spectrum. And while the details are a little bit different, but overall the shape is, is, is quite well. So this approximation really works well. Another milestone was, and I will talk a little bit about that one, is to produce circularly polarized harmonics. Why is this so important? Uh, why this is so important? You have heard actually a month ago from Margaret uh, that you can do a lot of wonderful uh, experiments with this. 
nowadays. Uh, why was this a breakthrough? Well, so far I told you always that the electron was moving back and forth. So you drive it with a linearly polarized laser pulse, and what you're generating is linearly polarized harmonics. So think about the process that I've told you at the beginning, and think about this, you drive it with a circularly polarized pulse. You drive, drive away an electron, and now if it's a circularly polarized pulse, the electron wave pack will actually go away and will never return to your atoms. So you will never re, uh, generate actually harmonics with this. Now it was then interesting to figure out other schemes to do the circular harmonics. And I will talk for a moment about this. And there were several other milestones actually, where we were able to give some theoretical support for this. Now let's talk, let me talk a little bit about the circular polarized harmonics, because I think it's a nice example actually, where theory could first help a little bit, experiment, then theory could go ahead, and then experiment was going ahead again. So it is something really where, uh, theory and experiment could work very nicely together. So here, this was the first, it was the experiment in 2015 by Margaret and Henry, where they developed a new experimental technique actually to make circularly polarized harmonics. Now, how was this done? They took instead of one laser pulse, they took two laser pulses. One was right-handed circularly polarized and the other left-handedly circularly polarized. And they put the laser pulses together so that they came in at an angle. And if you work this out, then you figure out that at any point in space, what you are creating at the focus is a linearly polarized pulse by the superposition of the two. The only thing what is happening at this point, the linear polarization is in this direction. So let's say up and down. If I'm a little bit over here, I have again a linearly polarized pulse field, but it points in this direction. So at a certain angle. I come over here, it points like this. It's linearly polarized, but the polarization direction is rotating actually. So you're creating from any atom linearly polarized harmonics. If you bring them together again, you produce circularly polarized light again because you have linear polarized, linear polarized, and so on and so on. If you all superpose them, you make circularly polarized light actually. That was the big idea. And Mario and Henry were able to. Uh, show that this works. Now what you create with this, as I told you, is also auto second pulses. But since the, if the pulse is long, this process of high harmonic generation is happening in each cycle of the laser field. So what you're creating actually is not one auto second pulse, but you're creating many auto second pulses. So you create a train of auto second pulses. For certain experiments, it's much nicer to have not a train, but just one attosecond pulse, what we call an isolated attosecond pulse. Now, how can you do this? And at that time, that was not possible, but there were ideas, well, either you can shorten your pulse or you can use a different technique. The ideas were around, but we could not do the experiment at that time, but we could do the theory at that time. So we worked together with Margaret and Henry and said, well, either you can shorten your pulse, and what you see, if you have a long pulse, you create one auto second pulse after the other, all circularly polarized. Or if you shorten the pulse, well, you create only one auto second pulse. That is one idea how to do it. The other idea is since you have two pulses, if they come at the same time, you're creating a train of auto second pulses. But if you start to delay the two pulses a little bit to each other, then they have less overlap actually. And what you have then is at some point you're creating only an isolated after second pulse. So the idea were out and here theory could help that to tell this should work actually. And uh, so Margaret and Henry with collaborators went, went ahead and they made it to work two years later. So then experiment was ahead again and uh, they created the first isolated auto second pulses that were circularly polarized at that time. And actually they went a further thing ahead. They said, well, if it works for circular polarizing polarization, it should work also for elliptical polarization. So nowadays we can create these isolated auto second pulses with circular polarization, with elliptical polarization, with linear polarization. We have full control over the polarization actually. I think this is a nice example actually here how Agila experiment and theory working hand in hand actually. Uh, with a, certainly here in this case, a lot of 
drive from the experimental group uh, that is going ahead here in order. Now, uh, let me one, add one last thing in this part of my talk. Go back once again to this topic of that all these musicians have to play uh, in phase and all the atoms, the radiation that comes out from the atom are in phase. And I would just like to go over to this, what we are currently working on. So an ongoing project that is at the moment in, uh, in my group actually, uh, that has been started by Bruni Reef, was left in 2021 and it's now continued by Bijan. Uh, we are looking at so-called phase maps. So uh, I don't want to walk you through this whole map and how to understand it, but essentially what we are showing you here is the phases of the harmonics, how they are generated in a laser focus. So here's the harmonic seven, here's the harmonic 13, here's the harmonic 19th. And here's, this is the laser focus in propagation direction and perpendicular to it. Now you would like that all the radiation is in phase. So if you look at this figure, you're looking at uh, regions actually, where the color is not changing very much. So if you look, for example, at such a region here, these harmonics that are generated here from the different atoms are very much out of phase. So you will not generate a lot of microscopic radiation from here. But for example, here is a region where there is a larger region that has more or less all the same color. So the harmonics that are generated here are more or less all in phase. So you will get a nice microscopic signal from here. Now, how can you select now from where you get your harmonic generation? This depends on where you're placing your gas jet now. So you can place your gas jet either, let's say somewhere over here, you will not get good harmonics, or you place the gas jet over here where you're getting good harmonics actually. So we can try to start now identify or first confirm what is done known in experiment for quite some time already, that you have to place your gas jet actually behind the focus uh, to get the best harmonics. This is known for quite some time, but it's very nicely shown also with the map. Uh, so far, this I've been done always only for, and this is more for the experts or for monochromatic pulses. We can do this now, really taking into account the, uh, the whole con uh, face map also for short Gaussian pulses. And we can start playing a little bit around with this. Actually, you would not like to have your, you would like to have your gas jet not behind the focus because this is not the highest intensities. You would like to have it exactly at the focus. So we are trying to find condition actually where such a nice region here of where all the harmonics are in phase is not behind the focus, but is exactly at the focus. So this is something what we are working on. And we expect that we get stronger harmonics from this and uh, uh, which is important now for the next step. So with this, I'm coming also over to the second part of my talk. So what are you doing with these kind of pulses, with kind of isolated pulses? What you would like to do is, coming back to the very beginning of my talk, you would like to take a photo. So you would like to create a shutter of a camera actually, a shutter where something is starting and where something is stopping. Now the technique for this is known for a long time. It's a pump probe technique, pump probe technique. So you essentially need two laser pulses for this. You need a pump pulse and you need a probe pulse and you have a time delay in between. The pump pulse initiates something, let's say in a molecule, and the probe pulse is then testing the molecule or imaging the molecule. You would like to change the time delay. You want to have short pulses so that this time delay can be as short as possible. If you have R2 second pulses here, you can make your time delay R2 seconds long. This is a wonderful idea, has been used a lot with picosecond pulses, with femtosecond pulses. It cannot be used with R2 second pulses for now because we cannot make these R2 second pulses strong enough so that we get enough signal for, from such a pump probe process. That's why we want to have other second pulses more, more uh, efficient, more stronger, more intense. That's why we are looking at these kind of processes that I've looked before. We would like to identify regions here where we have harmonics actually most efficient from the focus region. Now, this kind of thing one cannot do. Uh, now, researchers don't stop there when they come to a point where they cannot do something, but they get inventive actually. So if you cannot do it with two autosecond pulses, uh, then maybe there are ideas where 
you can use an attosecond pulse and a femtosecond pulse, or maybe only a femtosecond pulse. So people became very inventive after they figured out that at this time, this is not possible up to now with two attosecond pulses. And let me talk about two ideas that are used in our field for quite a bit. One is a so-called street camera. Now, what is a street camera? Uh, let's, see, let's say you have a signal with, uh, that comes from an incident light pulse that makes uh, some, creates photoelectrons as a function of time. And you're creating, at some point, you're creating a lot of photoelectrons, and at later times, you're creating less photoelectrons. And you would like to image this now, somehow, these kind of time distributions. So the idea behind this, how you can do this, is around for many, many years. You send the photoelectrons, the electrons through an electric field. Uh, electric fields are deflecting, as we know, electrons. And then you can put them on a fluorescent screen. Now, if you do it in a clever way, that during this time where the electron, this, these electrons are passing this capacitor, you're increasing the voltage between in the capacitor then the first electrons that are coming here will be deflected less than those that are coming in the back. And you're mapping actually this time information, how many photoelectrons you have at a certain time onto a spatial information actually here. Now, this is a wonderful idea, has been done since the 50s or 60s, uh, maybe even longer is, th is this around. It does not work on the R2 second time scale because you cannot make this ramp up times fast enough, actually. So we need something where the field is changing much faster on the time scale of femtoseconds, actually. And we have something, it is a laser pulse. It's just the oscillation period of a laser pulse is two femtoseconds. So we can just uh, use a femtosecond laser pulse to do the same kind of trick here. So we are using an attosecond pulse here that is creating the photoelectrons. And then we are taking the electric field of a femtosecond laser pulse to deflect the electrons. And what you are getting then is the energy of these electrons you are detecting, and the signal is changing actually, and it's changing here on a femtosecond time scale here actually. And you can get actually information about this that is less than one femtosecond, so you're on an attosecond time scale. So you can create an attosecond street camera. Now you can go even one step further. And you can take this whole attosecond pulse away and you can still get attosecond resolution just from a femtosecond pulse by thinking about that, well, it is oscillating in time. But now if you take into account also that instead of a linearly polarized pulse, you take a circularly polarized pulse, then within three femtoseconds, the polarization direction is actually rotating uh, in, in time over a full circle. Now that is, looks like what I'm just showing you with my hand is looking nothing else like a clock. Yeah, so we have the polarization direction of a femtosecond laser pulse that is acting like the clock hand of a clock. And it is going around in one circle within 2.6 femtoseconds. So for the, from the direction of the electric field, we have again out of second solution. Now this is not a clock like what Junier and others are doing. This is uh, something what we are calling an auto clock here. Yeah. Yeah. So how can you use something like this? Well, if you think about an atom, you would, and you're stripping away electrons from it, then what you would expect is a signal that in momentum space actually looks like a circle. Why? Well, an atom is something that is almost symmetric. So it doesn't matter in which direction actually the polarization direction points. You will get a circle, something like this, and obviously there is no kind of time information and no kind of information in this. But if you go away from an atom and you go to, away to the simplest molecule actually, what you are getting then is, so here's a molecule with two centers. It's the simplest molecule I can think of. It's the H2 plus molecule. It's two protons and one electron. Then there is certainly some directional information about this. For example, in an H2 plus molecule, we know that the electric field points along the internuclear distance. Electrons are usually, or this was expected, that electrons are uh, emitted more easily than if the electric field points in this direction. If you calculate the momentum distribution, 
you expect that you have a strong signal in this direction, a low signal in this direction, a strong signal in this direction, a low signal in this direction. This is what it was expected. You're mapping the direction of the electric field in which direction it has point directly onto the photoelectron uh, energy or momentum distribution. So this experiment for H2 plus has been done a few years ago. It was done in the group of Rainer Dörner in, in Germany. And at that time, uh, the surprising thing was that, well, you're not getting this distribution out, but you're getting a distribution out that is tilted a little bit in its maximum. Now we could be, we were at that time be able to do the uh, ex, uh, theoretical calculation for this one. And our maxima here are pointing also in the same direction as the, what is found in experiment. And what we could use from this, there was a lot of information that we could get out of this. But one thing that we could get out of this is that the electron leaves the molecule with a delay of 350 attosecond as compared to the situation. So the electric field vector had rotated a bit already. So it was leaving 350 attoseconds later than one was expected already. So clearly a measurement on an ultra short time scale where you can get a lot of information on an attosecond time scale without ever taking an attosecond part here actually. <clears throat> Let me finish here. I think I should talk for about 40 minutes. So let me uh, move into finishing here now to move you a little bit over what we are doing now at the moment, because this was uh, some time away and it's completed process. One of the things that we are doing, so here is just again the maxima, uh, where we are finding the maxima, is Jonas Gebre is looking at this, not with circularly polarized pulses, but with elliptically polarized pulses and see what we can get on top of this. Besides this, we are also looking to, at something where we might get spin polarized electron admission array. And to do this, we are not completely including the spin in our calculations, but we are looking at the ionization probability in a circularly polarized field, how it depends on the magnetic quantum number of the initial state. What does this mean? We are taking, for example, the neon atom or the argon atom, you can have magnet, it's a 2p state or a 3p state. It have, can have a magnetic quantum number plus one, minus one, and zero. That means in a circularly polarized field, the, well, if the field is rotating like this, you have electrons that are co-rotating with the, with the field and those that are counter-rotating with the field. And the question for a long time already is, which electrons are easier to ionize? Those that are co-rotating or those that are counter-rotating, actually. Now, that's a question that is around for quite some time already. And uh, it's depicted, actually, the results here in this graph, things that we have done and things that have been done long time ago. It was done long time ago with a single photon ionization. Yeah? And there it was found that co-rotating electrons are easier to ionize than counter-rotating electrons. The whole thing has started, not surprisingly, in in, in US, when you think about this with Ugo Fano, uh, so it's a process that Fano has looked at again. Gila is also involved in this, uh, uh, a guest that is very often coming to, to Gila at the moment, Peter Sola, has worked on this process quite a bit. So you find a lot of things over there recently, but not very recently. Now this process came up once again with, when I looked at it, with uh, strong laser pulses at 800 nanometers. And this is the so-called tunneling regime here. So we had looked at this at short wavelengths and now at long wavelengths. And the surprising thing at that time was that, hey, here it's not longer the co-rotating electrons that are easier to ionize, but it's the counter-rotating electrons that are easier to ionize. So how do you see this in this picture? Well, I'm showing you the the ratio of co-rotating over counter-rotating here, essentially. And you see in this part, it's the co-rotating that are easier to ionize. Here, it's the counter-rotating that are easier to ionize. Both these limits are understood in theory. Here, there is a dotted line. Theory works very nicely through this. Here in this part, it's also theory can reproduce it. So our question for this one was, well, here it's the co-rotating one that are easier to ionize. Here's the counter-rotating ionize. How do you come from here to here? And this is something that 
Jovenske, Lucas, and Spencer have worked on it quite a bit, and they produce the, all this dot here in between, where we are now going very nicely from one side to the other side. So, and you're seeing the ratio is changing actually from that co-rotating electrons are easier to ionize 10 times over co-rotating to very quickly, if you change the wavelengths just by a few hundred of nanometers to that counter-rotating are easier to ionize. Now, I will not go into all the details how you explain this, but I give you a flair of that. Uh, and I give you a flair of this one in two different ways. So for those of you who like selection rules, et cetera, here's a picture of how you can look at this whole thing with selection rules. You start in a certain case with certain magnetic quantum numbers, you calculate with the selection rules which kind of pathways you have, and you figure out that if you go to a higher photon process, that the counter-rotating electrons have actually more pathways to go than the co-rotating ones. And that explains why at these higher photon processes, uh, we have additional pathways. And that's why the ionization probability for those, it's easier to emit counter-rotating electrons than co-rotating ones. Now we call this pathways. And if you are states, we call this doorway states. And when we talked to Stephen and Kenna about this, they made this wonderful picture out of this, that for them, it just means, well, these electrons, the counter-rotating electrons, they have an easy pathway through a door, that's the doorway state, out of the atom, while the other ones don't have this pathway. For them, this pathway is actually blocked. Um, so you, can, you might prefer this picture, or you might prefer this wonder, one of these wonderful illustrations that Stephen is actually doing. We are continuing on this one at the moment. We are trying to understand this, uh, this further. With this, I'm uh, at the end. And uh, I hope that I could show you something by uh, that this uh, whole auto word or this whole word of ultra short pulses actually is for us a very fascinating one. That's why we are uh, so eager to, uh, to investigate it. And maybe you understand also a little bit that this kind of photograph that you can see where there is a bursting bubble, so a soap bubble actually, and you can see actually you can, just take a photo and you can try to understand how it's exploding is for us very similar like an experimental electro photo electro momentum distribution from which we see how a molecule is exploding actually this on a time scale of let's say 10 to the minus 4 femtos uh, not femtoseconds 10 to the minus 4 seconds this on the time scale of atom seconds thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much, Andreas, for a great colloquium. If you're online and would like to ask a question, we are monitoring the chat. Tyler is going to do that. If you have some questions, you're going to raise your hand. I'd like to give priority to those of you who are not experts in this field, if you have a question. But let's open it to the audience for questions. Yeah. I'm going to bring this microphone up and you can talk to it. Thank you. Would you like to say your name? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm KB uh, from the EDM group. Um, I noticed that uh, so uh, for the high harmonic generation, we're using a gas jet. And as an ion trapper, I like to think of uh, why don't we use trap ions or trap atoms where they have like well defined positions and uh, so that's easy. It, I, I, I suppose it will be easy to calculate like phase matching and things like that. Is it because like um, the uh, atoms used cannot be trapped at this point? Or is it because like the, the yield that you expect from the current number of atoms that we can trap is simply not enough for some other reasons? Yeah, it is the second one. So we have started to look at this actually. Adam Kaufman came to us with, with this idea. And uh, so we looked at this and you can get some interesting features from this. Uh, a kind of the problem is, I give it back to you. Can you trap one trillion atoms in your ion trap? I will do it. You will do it, but once you have done it, we talk. <laughs> Thank you. Great, great thing, yeah. So it's, it's, it's the second one. You need a large number of atoms actually to, uh, to produce a high yield. Yeah, yeah. But if you could, if you could trap that many. Let, let me give you the mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, just to, to let people. People know there's something called quasi phase matching, like periodically pulled. If you could trap that many atoms and, and locate them 
in the right places, that would be really neat. Oh, right? Somebody should do a theory paper on this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would like to collaborate with you on that and, and we think about it. Yeah. <laughs> You are a circularly polarized person <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I have a question myself. Um, so if you can make these addo clocks with femto second pulses, can you do the same thing with addo second pulses and go to the next level or are they too weak? Uh, in principle, you can do this too. People have started with this already. Uh, there are not too many results out of this, but in principle, you could try to do this. Yeah, mm -hmm. you could try. This is one way how to get sept to second resolution so beyond r to seconds it's sept to seconds yeah and if you have seen this uh one of the let me go back to one slide i didn't talk about this in detail but uh here up there you have a theoretical prediction together with margaret and henry out there how you can actually produce sept to second uh waveforms already yeah, and then you can ask your question, well, if I now take a zeptosecond circularly polarized pulse, what kind of time resolution can I What's have? a zeptosecond? That the zeptoseconds is 10 to the minus 21 seconds. Yeah. More questions? So I hesitate a little because it's a bit technical, but the, you had those very nice maps of the phase uh, through the focus. And I was wondering if you had included the index of refraction of the medium or if this is a low density. Uh, you, you caught me on this. No, we have not included it. It is the okay, simplest yeah. way of us. Yeah, what we have what we have done here is what we were able to do is people have done this all the time with the so-called GUI phase, yeah. which is a monochromatic, infinitely long pulse. Right. And instead of we are using at the moment uh, a short Gaussian pulse, one of our next step is to to put all these kind of extra effects in. Yeah, I think so this it, is the it basic should thing. be yeah. very doable. It should be very so, doable, but you um, start out and uh, this yeah. is the first step that we took and uh, these. Uh, um, these face maps looks already different, especially in the transverse direction. You see that this it is much more restricted than in this way. We understand yeah. this also, and all these effects need to be into account. Yeah, over the next year. Yeah, Bijan, it's your it's your task, right? <laughs> Hi, I'm Tim. I'm working with Henry and Margaret. So following up on that uh, co-atom questions, if you are going to use a solid that has a well-defined position location, uh, you probably can do the better calculation. And I know lots of experiment going on in the solid state have more generation. So I was wondering, do you think those theory, they are complete or there's still controversial debates going on? Oh. I think theory is never complete. That's a very general answer. I think the same thing like in, in experiment. You see very quickly here that uh, what we are doing on the macroscopic side is actually a very crude approximation. We have seen for all these things where we are showing what, what is uh, the spectrum of, an, uh, of the high harmonic generation, we get more or less the spectrum. But I would expect if you go into details, if you look more into details in certain things, we will need improvements on that side also. So this, the theory is here far away from, from, uh, from being perfect. What we have achieved by, by including now the solutions of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation of this one to this, what we have done before, and you might be familiar with this, is uh, with approximated solutions. With approximate solutions, we would be able to look only at the highest harmonics and these kind of phase maps. With the full solution now, we are able also to look at the lower harmonics actually. Uh, because with time-dependent Schrodinger equation has an exact solution there, these approximated solutions don't have, are not applicable in this region. So in this sense, we have worked on the microscopic quite a bit, how to get them in the existing microscopic co code. And one of the next steps would be that after including all these other stuff that Henry was just talking about, also to uh, get better uh, codes and, and include more things on the macroscopic side, actually.
Hi, this is KB again from the EDM group. I'd like to follow up on my question. Um, uh, partly because I also want to think of what I want to write into my research proposal. Uh, what kind of uh, atoms or ions uh, work best in the gas jets? And suppose now I can trap a million atoms or ions in however small space you want. Uh, what's the ideal uh, Goldilocks species? Um, that's a question we have not thought about, actually. Uh, because in the, in the field of um, ultra-short laser pulses, you do all these experiments with rare gas atoms. Uh, that, is, that is the go-to. So at the moment, we are doing all our calculations for rare gas atoms. There was so far, there was not much um, motivation to look at other atoms, but we can do this actually. We have, for, uh, we have worked out potentials uh, and uh, we have descriptions for this that we can use also other atoms in our calculations, but we have not done so. So what is the best atom here? I cannot tell you at the moment. Um, open research yeah. question. Sorry? Is this your open research question? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, there, there, are two, there, are my, there are too many open research questions. And if you can motivate to look, us to look into it, we will do it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Happy to do that. I feel like a student. And as a student, I wish to ask a question, <laughs> which is you are using the Schroeder equation. So clearly quantum mechanics is very important here. And yet to me, it sounds as though you're throwing sledgehammers at these atoms uh, and molecules in order to, to photograph them. And I'm wondering, what's the interplay of, of quantum mechanics and, and something that maybe when you observe it, it's becoming a classical thing? I'm not quite sure that I understand your question. Uh, the, we, we are not looking at the measurement process here at all. We are looking just at the at the quantum mechanical process how to how, how the electron is emitted, but uh, what you I think where your question is uh, is going to is the classical process of of measurement afterwards, and that is a process we are not looking at at all. No, I guess what I'm trying to say is, aren't all the things that you're doing to your atoms and molecules kind of looking at watching them do their stuff? Doesn't watching them do their stuff change what they do? Ah, okay. Yeah, of course we are. Uh, <laughs> this, this is, yeah, that's a great question to, to ask. Uh, we are interrupting the process there and we are disturbing the process also, of course. And uh, that is actually, um, it, it's, it's a wonderful question actually, because there is with the Arto second street camera, there was a long debate for a more, almost a decade actually, what we are observing there. And uh, I didn't go into the detail, but uh, Actually, I can point to one of the, here was a, here's a kind of plot I didn't talk about. And that was a, there was, it's, it's written here that they have measured a delay of 21 nanoseconds actually. That it's, it's said that uh, an electron that is emitted from a 2P shell in a neon atom is delayed by 21 nanoseconds to the emission of an electron from a 2S shell. And, uh, the interpretation of this kind of experiment is at least on for, for a decade already, what has been measured there already. And uh, part of the opinion that I would behind this, because we have done some research on this one, is actually that it's the influence of this streaking field that you are using actually that is introducing this delay. So you're not really looking at the emission time, that there is a difference in the emission time, but it, this delay time is induced by your, the way you, that you are measuring this, these time delays. So maybe this goes a bit into your question, actually, that you have to look at this, how you are measuring something, and that can be, uh, deter, disturb your system, and you have to, uh, you have to identify is um, how much the, the uh, the measurement is actually influencing your system uh, and uh, the result of your measurement. Yeah. Oh, I, I, okay, I'm gonna answer what I thought he was saying in a different way. So, yeah, so, I, so you're, you're, you're asking about classical mechanics. Oh, if you're throwing a sledgehammer at the problem, why is it not classical? 
Well, if you use the WKB approximation, you get the wrong answer. So if you if you use you know semi-classical approximation, limit of large quanta, it only works for like IR lasers, very long wavelength lasers, and you get just not you get complete garbage for short wavelengths. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Anybody online? Okay, well, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks, Andreas.